Welcome to Building Great Sales Teams, a show dedicated to making sales teams tick, tick, boom. Great sales teams are not recruited, they are built block by block. Let's get to work. Wow. <laughs> and so that's how we're starting the podcast today. Uh, no, but for real, how are you guys doing? Good morning, noon, and night. Um, my name is Ryan. You guys probably have heard me one time before. I am the uh, producer of the Building Great Sales Teams podcast, but today we have something special. We are going to be doing a Q&A. So I am in the driver's seat. I will be interviewing my man, Doug, uh, the main host of the Building Great Sales Teams podcast. So let's give him a round of applause as he comes on to the shot, I guess. <laughs> Appreciate you, Ryan. This is the... Uh the brainchild um, that we've been coming up with for a while now. We've been wanting to do a QA and a episode, and uh, I'm excited about it. I love the way you put this together, so I think the, the listeners are in for a treat. Yeah, it should, it should be a lot of fun, or it could be, like, the worst thing ever. So let's... Uh Let's hope for the, the first <laughs> Let's one, not right? Have that juju. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. Okay, so we're yeah, gonna now. You put that out there, so no. if it's bad, it's your fault, not mine. <laughs> oh, here. we got our wood. Um, <laughs> so the first question we got is going to be coming from our man Brent Attaway. He is the, uh, I guess, CEO of Follow Up Fortunes. Yeah, and uh, his question is. Hi, this is Brent Attaway. I am with Follow Up Fortunes, and my question for you is, Doug, why did you decide to do this podcast? Who inspired you to do it, or what inspired you to do this? Because I've watched you go all in with this. You got a freaking wrapped trailer <laughs> um, for your podcast. You built out a whole entire podcast studio, mobile and in your office what's the motive? What is it that you're trying to accomplish and what really inspired you to go this far into it? That is the question. So Brent wants to know why the podcast? So it started out as just a podcast, right? Mm -hmm. And it's turned into this monster, you know, and it, and it may not be the monster download numbers or anything yet, but it's, it's definitely a big part of the company now. Where oh, for sure where we've got four or five people, different people in the company involved in it. They have hands in it. You know what I mean? And um, so the, the reason that I started it is because it's part of the program that I'm paying for, which is Apex, right? Mm -hmm. So with Apex, you get access to building your machine. And uh, one of the steps in building your machine is to start a podcast. The whole idea around a podcast is to build authority, Right. And, um, you know, my authority is in building sales teams. So I did the podcast around that. And so I started having guests on and um, I just got super passionate about it. You know, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed having the conversations and then seeing the impact that it had, you know, immediately week one, first episode, had a bunch of people listen to it, loved the Kodak episode. It's got a lot of great feedback there. So it's part of building your machine, building your authority and then that allows you to gain clients, right? And so uh, there's two parts of this too. There's getting clients through the podcast. There's qualifying clients by sending them the podcast and saying, hey, listen to these few episodes. Let me know what you think. And you're building an authority along the way. And then there's the clients that you've already gotten through it or already have, and the podcast is a value add, Right. So I have a consulting package where I'll basically build you a sales team from scratch, right? Right. And part of that consulting package, I'm going to put you on the podcast as an example of my work, basically. Yeah. And so that gives you as a client exposure and then as well as it validates whatever you're doing, whatever your product, it, it validates you. I mean, what do we know about press? What do we know about being in the news is whether it's good or bad, it's good. No, there is no bad press. There is no bad press, exactly. So if you, as a the product provider and the client of mine, can send this to your potential clients and kind of, hey, check it out, I was on a podcast, whatever the case is, however it relates, comes up in conversation, 
or your follow-up process, that's going to validate you as being a, an authority in your field because you're on a podcast talking about those things. Right. You know and uh, one, one example of that that we had in the podcast trailer, because he did bring that up, we have a podcast trailer that you guys seen, uh, was Brent Knott. He mm-hmm. came on, he was one of your client or your first client. Yeah. And he came on, he was able to share um, what you had taught him and how that has helped his business. And we also got a lot of more tactical information out of that as well. Right. Um, just by one, building those connections, one, adding that value to somebody else mm-hmm. who in turn could come onto the podcast and then share the value that you, that they gain from you yeah. and then add value to the listeners who may not be, ready to start building that sales team just yet. Yeah. So that brings up a good point. Uh, The value that Brent added to the podcast himself. um, And that's also a form of free consulting. So you think about these people that you want to work with, maybe you can't necessarily afford to work with them, right? You know, uh, we had Brent Attaway on the podcast a couple weeks ago. Not everybody can afford to work with that dude. You know, he's amazing at what he does. Right. And so, Whenever that happens, you can reach out to him and say, hey, I want to bring you on my podcast. You can talk about this subject. You can further your message. You know what I mean? You can dial in uh, what you want to talk about. And at the same time, though, I get to ask the questions. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. So I'm going to ask questions that I would in a consulting call. You right. Know what I mean? Exactly. So you get free consulting. That was probably one of the funniest things that Thomas Keenan told me about, you know, having your own podcast is you get free consulting. And then uh, beyond that, there's relationship building so you know me and brent not have a great relationship you know we started out as uh both being in the rbo mastermind and then it went from there to him being a client and now he's been on the podcast you know i've sent him several deals uh since then so we are building this great relationship that i know is going to last for hopefully the rest of both of our lives you know right. whether it be a, on a friend level or a business level so uh podcast is great for relationship building And, you know, fortunately and unfortunately, fortunately for the listeners, unfortunately for my business, if I have a choice between building out an SOP for a piece of my business or jumping on and and getting the guest on the podcast, I'm going to do the podcast. I have so much fun (laughs) with this. You know what I mean? It's like my, the podcast has become my new hobby. I used to play rugby and hit people. Now I jump on <laughs> now you just talk to people jump on zooms and <laughs> and in-person recordings and talk to people I, I talk out my feelings instead of hitting hit them right um and so that that can be the the downside is it is addicting you know we're doing three episodes a week now yes we are i i could long term you know maybe after another 10 years i, I could see a career in podcasting you know a straight up building great sales teams is its own show you know what i mean and we make money on the podcast straight up it's not you know a client deal it's not a authority deal any of that stuff it's you know our business is podcasting so that would be awesome <laughs> um because that's definitely something that i've always wanted to do is just like work in audio uh-huh. for a like a job job which yeah. i do now um, I just do a lot more admin work too. Right. So we'll, <laughs> we'll see if hey, we can bring work, that ten you work years. For a small business owner. Man. <laughs> All right. So um, I hope I hope that answered your question. Uh, one number one podcasting. You help build your machine. Mm-hmm. Um, you get you get to add value to other people's lives. You get to you know build those relationships too. It's just plain fun. Like podcasting is. Is great. So uh, if you don't have a podcast or if you're looking to get on a podcast, um, you can look up Doug at www.texasbizdad.com and uh, get in contact with us. We'll put you on the show. Um, so our next question came from Mark Zalmanoff. Did I say that right? Mm-hmm. Zalmanoff, yeah. Zalmanoff, okay. Mark the Z, Mark Fitness Z, Ninja. Fitness Ninja. Hey there, my name is Mark Zalmanoff, AKA the Fitness Ninja, owner of Mark Z Fitness and co-owner of Fit Pro Collective. I do fitness coaching, business coaching, and do a lot of actually running my mouth. But my question for Doug is this, in your entrepreneurial journey, what is the biggest setback that you have had that's actually resulted in the biggest growth that you've had? I'd love to know. Thanks so much. Oh, and that's it. That's a big one. What is the biggest setback that resulted in your biggest growth? So 
I have a couple that I want to cover because one was more of a a mental, you know, more uh, I I grew mentally, and then the other one was more uh, the business grew right, and so the first one was probably the the biggest setback was learning about the franchise tax. So the franchise tax in Texas is a tax that is applied to your business, and I'm going to misquote it, but um, that's fine. This is not financial advice. Uh, it's applied to your business when you get over, I believe, $2 million in revenue, straight up revenue. It's like 1.8 or $2 million, something like that. Hopefully they've raised it. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's a straight up like, hey, you're doing business in Texas. You made a lot of money. So now we're going to tax you, a oh, franchise wow. tax. So I'll never forget, the franchise tax was 25000 Okay, this was back in uh, 2014, the first time I had to pay it. And now I just know I got to pay it, right? Well, I got the bill in the mail. And like, you know, most entrepreneurs do, we go back to running our business and forget about it. <laughs> and then I got another bill in the mail. <laughs> and then about 90 days after the first bill, they locked my bank account. Oof. So when it comes to most bills they can't touch your personal finances your business finances or anything not when it comes to taxes they'll go right in there and take your money so they zeroed out our account and then they uh, sent our account negative like i think with fees and everything it went right back to like twenty five thousand dollars right and you know i was operating on razor thin margins back then so you know we maybe they maybe got five six grand out of the account and then we went negative another 25 grand right jeez so that's when most, not most, that's when some entrepreneurs or some business owners give up. Mm -hmm. Bank accounts negative, can't make payroll, you know what I mean? So what am I going to do? And now my AT&T payments, you know, or my client payments are going into that account. And I, you know, I don't have enough time to call them up and say, hey, to redirect the payments because I'm not going to be able to make payroll. So that week that that happened, you know, obviously I pulled from personal funds. You know, I think that week payroll was probably 38 to 40 grand, right? So I pulled from personal funds. I took out a payday loan. I uh, borrowed money from family. I mean, I did everything I could and I made payroll that week. That was just to get through that week, right? Right. And then after that, um, it was redirecting the payments, getting them into my personal account, writing checks. It was just all these things I had to do to keep the business afloat, keep the business running, redirecting uh, charges from, you know, the automatic accounts, all this crazy stuff. And I think I was just in crisis mode. I was in, um, I, you know, I'm a wartime general, so I went into action. And when I got done with it, I looked back at it, you know, and I got the account back positive i paid back the 25 grand i got the account back positive and started running everything through my operating account again when i looked back at that situation i was just like if being negative 25 grand in my operating account and not being able to make payroll didn't stop me nothing can yeah. so from then on my mentality was the only thing that can stop me from being successful in this business is me it's just the man in the mirror and then it, it was a very extreme ownership situation where now moving forward, everything, you know, rose and fall, fell on me. So that there's a lot of power in that, you know, once you realize that. So that was the mental one. Now, as far as the business, um, I've been an AT&T dealer for 12 years now. Uh, I've done uh, AT&T door to door for 11 years. And then... What happened about a year ago, post-COVID, you know, we were running our door-to-door -door campaign, getting it back rolling and everything, and I'm looking at the campaign as a whole and the margins involved with it, and uh, so the, the, the setback is that there wasn't a lot of money in the campaign anymore. Right. Things were changing in, with the client. Things were changing with the marketplace. It wasn't the hottest product on the marketplace anymore, so... The, the setback is that this is a business that I've been able to rely on to feed the business. 70 to 80% of our income always come from, has always came from AT&T as a client. 
And so it was kind of, you know, since then we've been winding AT&T down as a client because the, the margins just aren't great anymore, right? And so um, we switched from a door-to-door model to a referral-based model, which, you know, put kind of the power in the salespeople's hands to manage the relationships better and then they would make more money. They would, And then all of a sudden our salespeople were all making six figures, right? Because it was a referral-based they manage referral relationships versus going and knocking on a door. And the referral relationships came from things like apartment complexes, Mm -hmm. home builders, real estate agents, right? And so now they were all six-figure producers, so we could recruit for six-figure producers. So it it leveled up our AT&T campaign so much. And then when we started the solar campaign, they were pretty equal campaigns, you know, especially when you get into the closers on the solar side and the area managers on the AT&T side, they were somewhat equal campaigns, so there wasn't any envy going both ways. And I, and I feel like, you know, although now we only have, you know, 20-plus people in the company, 25 people in the company, and before we had 100-plus, now the, the, income of the, the income average of those 25 people is around 60 or 70 grand versus before it was like 30 or 40, you know what I'm saying? And that's, that's a big jump. yeah. And that's from like two years ago. That's not like infl- you can't blame inflation on that one, right? <laughs> so, so that was probably the biggest setback, and then growth from that in the uh, in on the uh, Argenta side of the business. And then shortly after that, you know, we lost our MDU director to uh, a lack of core value alignment, is what I'm going to call it. <laughs> Um, Very political. Yeah, it was scandalous for sure. So we lost our MDU director. And so that is probably, now I'm in that, right? Now we're pivoting over to a a referral-based solar model on the MDU side. So now I think in six months I'm going to be able to look back and say losing our MDU director was an awesome setback because it set our salespeople up to make more money in solar as well as our company to be more aligned around solar yeah. as a product. It also kind of brings both um, both sides of the, the company together. Mm-hmm. So where we, I mean, we've always been building relationships, like even when it was your door-to-door campaign mm-hmm. versus the MDU, it was always, hey, uh, what, we, what we always preached was you are their personal concierge for AT&T. Right. Even when it was a door-to-door thing, it was, Hey, don't have them call. You call for them, or you you're the their point of contact for everything. Yeah. So now it's just kind of coming full circle to where, yeah, we had the two different divisions. Yeah, they do two totally different things. But at the end of the day, Argenta is your relationship builders. We're local. We're the yeah. people that um, you can call when you have an issue. You don't have to worry about sitting in long lines, so mm-hmm. to speak. So that's always great. That was a good answer. I like that answer. That that made me happy. Uh, cue, cue Andy Minio's You Can't Stop Me or Michael Jackson's Man in the Mirror. <laughs> and that is pretty much the gist of that answer. <laughs> so if you guys don't know Ryan, and I'm, I'm taking over the host mic real quick. If you guys don't know, <laughs> Ryan's background is in, uh, he's actually a, a producer for uh, music. So music production. And so he knows music inside and out. And it's it's fun to listen to you and Carl get into all your debates and stuff. And then me and you. Yeah, oh yeah. We on that's several a whole nother podcast. That's a whole nother episode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so our next question is gonna be coming from uh Brock Hensley. Let's listen in. Hey Doug, my name is uh, Brock Hensley. I'm the owner of Concierge Construction and Carl's painting, staying at home improvement. Um, what we do is we're a turnkey foot business for uh, real estate investors who really don't want to do the work or don't know much about it. And then we also want a full-time painting, staining, and home improvement business where we do full house paints, uh, stain fences, stain decks, etc. So my question is, at what point do you know it's time to hire a sales team? And when you do hire a sales team, how would you structure their pay based on being in a service industry like I am? You know, to sell painting jobs and to go out and meet clients and sell um, Turn key flips. Thank you. Okay, so can I start by saying I'm so 
happy for him to be like multitasking like that. He's like on a Peloton yeah. bike. <laughs> He's like, no, I got to get this question out. Yeah. <laughs> so that's kudos to you, sir. Kudos to you. Um, but the question was, um, when is it time to build that sales team or like start hiring salespeople? And then when they are selling a service like he's selling, how do you, how do you deal with that pay structure? Cause it's not like a one for one kind of, Hey, you sold a house, you get paid for that house. It's, right. it's kind of like, it's a, it's a little new, more nuanced mm-hmm. of 100%. a sell. So I'm always going to say, and I'm always going to advocate that you do not ha- hire a salesperson until you have built the sales program. And what I mean by that is you have the documents in place for them to view whether you're recruiting them or they're being onboarded, right? Or being trained. So those documents that you need, the first one is a comp plan. And and look, the word document is not archaic here. Like it, this is a Google doc, right? Mm-hmm. So a uh, comp plan is the first thing you obviously need. You know, how are you going to recruit someone if they don't know what they're going to get paid, right? Uh, the next thing you need is a, is, a, is a scope of work, right? That's basically what are they doing every day? You know, do you have leads for them already or are they door knocking? Are they calling age leads? Like, what is the scope of work? What does their day look like? And, and how do you want them to attack their prospecting? And uh, the way that you figure that out is based on what you do. You know what I'm saying? You just take the sales piece of what you do as an entrepreneur and you create a scope of work based on that. You increase the time because obviously they've got all day to prospect to present deals and close them. And and that's how you kind of work your scope of work. The next thing you're going to need is an opportunity structure. Now, I know it seems early on, but you want to show them the vision you have for someone that succeeds in sales at your company. You want to show them that, hey, you know, if you're, if you come into the company and you write, you know, 250000 in your first six months, whatever the case is, then I'll hire another salesperson for you to train and you to get, you know, overrides on or training pay or some type of incentive to bring them on, right? And that's how you're going to grow your sales team. And honestly, that's how you're going to grow your company. Sales can grow companies by themselves as long as you got the SOPs and processes in place to, to accept that growth and the ability to fulfill it, right? And then the next thing you're going to need is a script, a simple script that works in any situation, phone call, door, conversation, that you're having contact with a lead and you want to walk them through this process. You already have this process in place. It's just in your head. You need to get it out onto paper. And so, uh, and then uh, the last piece of that sales program is the orientation, also known as product knowledge. Basically, how can you educate them with enough to be dangerous and make a sale? What is that information? You know, can you put it into a Google slide presentation or a Loom video? Whatever the case is. Or, you know, a lot of times uh, with construction and uh, home services in general, there is a, uh, an equipment tutorial involved, right? So depending on the type of paint you use, the benefits of that paint, right? They, they have education surrounding their uh, products that you use, the inventory that you use, right? And you want to insert that into your product knowledge on top of uh, sales training that you're going to include in your orientation. So if you have that sales program built out, okay, now it's time to hire. Okay, so there's two versions of that. There's a commission salesperson, and this is a 1099 salesperson. This person is not going to be expected to come into the office every day. You know, maybe they, they'll come in once a month. Even if that, um, it's likely that they're going to be coming in, uh, uh, or it's likely that they're going to be on calls with you at, at the most, right? Right. 10, 1099 is a tough one because you want, you want to make sure they're very remote and they work out of their house, right? Because if they start working out of your office, they're not 1099 anymore, right? They start using... Your um, supplies and materials, they're not 1099 anymore, right? And a little hack that you can do, and this works in Texas, I don't know about other states, but if you charge them for training and uh, office supplies or training and materials, something like that, I charge my sales reps $5 a week, right? And I know it sounds crazy, but if you charge them that $5 a week, 
Now, now, granted, they're getting their base pay, so it's coming out of that. But anyways, if you charge them that five dollars a week, it creates the, it creates the, uh, the uh, illusion. Con- the well, not illusion. It's the <laughs> reality that they're a contractor, right? Right. If the IRS is listening, it's the reality that they're a contractor. <laughs> okay. No illusions over here. No. So if it is going to be a commission salesperson, ten ninety nine, then the answer is ASAP, right? Because you have no expense in order to bring them on, other than onboarding, training, your time, right? That is a risk that you can take in order to get one or two more sales a week. You know what I mean? So the good news is if it's a commissioned salesperson, your expenses don't start, aren't incurred until a sale is made. And if a sale is made, you have profit in that sale, right? So then you're able to, to pay any expenses that went along with that sale being made, right? So... That's the good news about commission. Now, W-2 is a whole different animal, right? And typically, you want it to be W-2 when you have to train this person from scratch. When And uh, you hire them when you can afford their base pay with the income you have in the company right now. All right? Okay. You need to be able to afford their base pay with the company that, with the income you have in the company right now, and then you can hire someone. And we can get into uh, how you structure pay based on that. So, so I it, had a I had a follow up sure. question with that. Um, so, like, when you're saying their base pay, are you are you talking like for the full year, or is there like a time that you you think it would be? So, like a three month base pay, or how how do you? So, when you look at your monthly gross profit, that there is enough in that you're comfortable giving away. You know what I mean? Let's just say it's two grand a month. Say okay. it's three grand a month. You're making that, it's left over, you're keeping it in the company, you've got your salary, your salary should be separate, right? Um, it's left over in the company, you're keeping that, you're putting it back into the company, whatever the case is, right? You've got a, a balance there. Um, that's when you, you know, okay, I can afford this, right? right. And th- that's the tough thing about W-2. You know, you're taking on employment taxes, you're taking on all these things, so you got to make sure that it's like, Whatever their base pay is going to be plus like 10%, just to be sure. So once once you have that in place, um, how do you structure the pay, right? So this is commission or W-2, it doesn't matter, because typically when you do a base pay, you do it against commission, right? So let's just say you're paying them 500 a week. You don't expect them to hit their base. They need to be hitting their commission, right? So it's base pay against commission, which means you either get the base pay or the commission, or there's base pay plus commission, right? You've already... You've already put in that base pay aside, so now you're going to give them commission on top, right? And so um, the way you structure that pay in general is uh, 60-40 early on. You want to leave yourself some room to adjust the compensation or give bonuses or incentives or, you know, maybe you're doing like a gas allowance or something like that. So, and, and what I mean by that is that's after materials, that's, that's after... Um, the job, right? Before you start incurring expenses like rent, office supplies, you know, labor, uh, uh, not labor, sorry, um, your back office labor, right? So if you look at the job by itself, you isolate that job by itself, and you're making, let's just say, $1,000 on that job, then the uh, salesperson's commission should be 60% of the profit from that job before you start incurring the back office expenses and or um, that's it. 60% should be for the sales program, right? Not the okay. salesperson, excuse me. The sales program, okay? And that's what you should be spending on that. And then 40% goes to the gross profit. That goes to the company that pays, you know, your back office people. That pays the rents and all that kind of stuff. You know okay. what I'm saying? Yeah. And so the, that in general when you're dealing with construction – and then that's how I operate on the commission side too. So if AT and T pays me a thousand dollars, this may make it easier for someone to understand. If AT and T pays me a thousand dollars for a client, then I'm spending six hundred dollars on the sales program and the people in it, right? And then I'm spending forty dollars or four hundred dollars on my back office and uh, any office supplies, expenses, stuff like that that comes with that back office, right? Right. And so that's kind of how you structure it. And then once you dial it in, 
and you get really good, then you can go to a like a 65-35 split. You know what I'm saying? But your profit is going to come from... That 40. Yeah, that 40, exactly. Okay, that makes sense. So that way you have... One, it, it keeps your salespeople happy because they're mm-hmm. seeing, hey, I'm getting a, a bigger chunk of the change. Yeah. But it keeps you from scrambling and trying to, like, miss out on, on IRS payments or whatever oh, yeah. you got going on that uh, might come up. Because I know uh, one thing that I've heard being talked about is that we're not going to be the company that pays you the most, but that's because we're a legitimate company. Right. And when you're a legitimate company, um, you have to, you have to be mindful of those things that come up Mm -hmm. and those things that might hide in the grass, so to speak. Yeah. If you're not too, too careful. A hundred percent. One of those things is, uh, employer taxes and social security taxes. Right. So Mm -hmm. the things that you're responsible for, I think it comes out to, Oh, 6.8%. So if you're paying commissions and W-2, if you're paying that to your employee, let's just say it's $1,000, now you've incurred $61 or $68 in additional expenses on top of that 1000 that you're going to have to pay uh, to Social Security and uh, uh, what's the other one? Social Security and uh, federal, federal uh, employer taxes. And so that's what a lot of people forget about. They're thinking, oh, I'm getting this full 35% or this full 40%, but no, you're getting 40% minus that 6.8%. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Yeah, now see, this is, uh, that's so much to think about when you're you're starting a business. It is, and it's tough to explain without a spreadsheet. (laughs) So what Doug said is put a spreadsheet in the... uh, Episode notes. No. <laughs> <laughs> Our next question is coming from Aaron Swars. Hey, what's going on, guys? I'm Aaron Schwartz, now in Rain Construction. The main portion of our business comes from residential re-roofing, with the rest coming from home remodels and new home developments. My question is, What has been the most effective way to structure a sales team? Do you break down into small teams with one team leader attached to each one? Or do you have one large sales force that has one sales manager in charge? Thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate your time. So we went from pay structure to team structure. How is the best way to structure um, a sales team? So... Would it be one singular person? So, like, like with us, I know how we do it. Um, we have Wayne, who's kind of like the top dog of all of it, or mm-hmm. and he he runs. Um, at one point, he was doing MDU um, and solar and door to door, as well as our marketing. We had a marketing person who he was also kind of head over mm-hmm. um, as the VP of sales, and after that. Um, when we had the door to door campaign, we had um, market managers. So we kind of structured it where there was it was a, a pyramid system where every there was levels to every. I know <laughs> I know that's not the right word to say, um, but it was legitimate. Like you you actually had you know training that was involved. We had mm-hmm. people who did the work, showed that they could accomplish those things, and were promoted into these positions. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't just, oh, you, you find 10 other people and right, you go right, to the next right. level. Yeah. It wasn't that at all. It was so training. So that brings up a good point. Now I got to defend this since you brought it up, right? <laughs> so one of the early objections we would get when we would recruit people is that, oh, you guys are a pyramid scheme, right? Right. So uh, first up, off, the easiest way to explain any company is a pyramid. You got the CEO at the top. Yeah. You've got his executive board. <laughs> it's You've got simple. middle management. And it gets bigger all the way down, obviously, down to the entry-level employee, which is the biggest group of people in a company, right? So that's just silly, first of all. But um, second of all, the, the way you tell the difference between a, a pyramid scheme and a, um, a legit opportunity structure, right, is in the pyramid scheme, you get 
you get paid and your income is based off of recruiting people into the scheme versus a legit opportunity structure. You get paid for selling product. Right. right? And so that, so that's the deal. Now, the way most opportunity structures are set up is so that you get paid for selling at first, selling the product at first, and then now you move up and 90% of your pay comes from selling the product and then 10% of your pay comes from overrides, right? And then you move up and now it's 70-30 and then you move up and now it's 50-50, right? And so you get to a position like Wayne's where, you know, 90% of his pay comes from overrides and managing and leading and being a leader in the company and then the rest comes from his individual sales that he makes every now and then through referrals, right? He's not right. out there knocking on doors. But to answer Aaron's question... Um, I like to work with the rule of five, you know, it, it makes things really easy, you know, so I, I like if you've got, you know, one to five people, one person managing those one to five people. Okay. Now, once you go to like, okay, and then this is also, so you got to qualify it, right? There's a lot of variables involved here. This doesn't work across all products, but when we're talking about, um, a, uh, an entry level sales position, you need more management at a lower level, if that makes sense. So once you get above five people, now you want to kind of create an opportunity structure that allows an assistant manager to be created. So I've got my market manager, my manager managing the five people, and now I hire six, and maybe I'll have my most seasoned person within that five people team train that six person, and now they're going to get overrides on them. They're going to start their own team. You know, this is where you get the very pyramid team scheme type stuff happening. But here's the bottom line. People get into the, this business for two reasons. Uh, the first one is compensation. The second is opportunity. The second is the most important. Opportunity is why people stay at, at sales organizations. Opportunity is, why, is how great sales teams are built. It's not, right. it's not from the commission from the individual product. You know, too many... Too many sales structures rely on that, and they won't be around for long. Or they're going to have bad quality, you know what I'm saying? Or they're going to be very uh, bottom-heavy and have no support, no leadership, no top structure because it can't get paid because they're all about their commissions, right? So, so again, going back to Aaron's question, um, when you're talking about an entry-level opportunity, which for him, he's a roofer, so I imagine he's got guys either knocking on doors or converting leads. It's somewhat of an entry-level opportunity, right? And so um, I would say one manager for five people, one manager and maybe two assistant managers for a team of like 13 people, including the manager, right? And so you kind of work in the role of five, right? Now, when you have a high-end sales position or a non-entry-level, an experienced sales position, you're able to have less management because these are seasoned salespeople. They know how to work their prospects, their pipeline. They don't need necessarily the 1.0 training. They need 2.0 and 3.0 training. You know what I'm saying? They need support and leadership, but you can have one manager managing like 10 people. You know what I mean? And that's, right. that's very much what, you know, uh, like uh, our RPD division is, Right. And, the, and right now, I'm the head of the RPD division, which is the referral partner division. So these are guys that go out, they make relationships with roofers, they make relationships with real estate agents, builders, and those uh, people send them referrals, right? The type of people I'm hiring for that position, they're relationship builders. They've been in sales for at least five plus years. You know what I'm saying? They know how to work their pipelines. They know how to maintain their relationships. And so they're not going to need a whole lot of direction from me other than product knowledge, if something's changing, you know what I mean, or life events, mentorship, that type of stuff. So I can probably manage uh, 10 people at one time if that's all I'm doing, right? right? Uh, but once it get, you know, I've got three guys right now, and once we get rolling over there, I'll probably hand that over to Wayne, and hopefully he's got some leadership on the solar side that he can help uh, balance those, those positions. So that's what I would say, Aaron, work in – in fives and as you add on five you want middle management being put in place you know what i'm saying to because it is it's it's hurting cats at an entry-level sales position you need to be having conversations with them daily 
and then they need to be having meetings daily. You know what I'm saying? It's daily accountability on the entry level side. As you move up in the sales position and things get more professional, more experienced, then you don't have as much management and you're able to manage more people. Right. And it gives them, because uh, once they get that experience of knowing how to kind of deal with their prospects, they'll have a lot less questions. Mm-hmm. I think that's like, it's all about the experience. However you structure it, you want to have who you, you need experience in there to kind of curtail any questions that could be a detriment to someone who's entry level. Well, and the bottom line is you got a baby entry level salespeople because they've never done sales before. They don't right. understand the concept of I have to go out and work or I won't get a paycheck or at least not a paycheck that's going to really support me and my family. You right. Know what I'm saying so um, you have to, they have to constantly be motivated, constantly be reminded of why, you know, and then a seasoned salesperson has spent a couple of years already honing in on their craft and honing in on their mental fortitude. So you don't have to baby them as much. You know what I'm saying? Less management, less managers. So our next question is coming from Jacob Leach. Hey, Doug. This is Jacob Leach with Wet Meadow Seed Sales in Cottage Grove, Tennessee. I wanted to come on and ask at what point as an entrepreneur do you decide to pivot into a different field or a different industry or move into a, a lateral position type in your own current market just if you're running into a ceiling for margins and or not being able to push your limits any farther than you than you already have in your current industry what at what point do you make that switch do you make that that pivot to to move forward or to just change and say okay i'm i'm beating my head against the wall and not going anywhere with this anyway can't wait to hear your feedback thank you sir so um he's he's asking how when is it the time to kind of change course kind of pivot when is it that you've hit the glass ceiling and I'm saying glass um kind of how he worded it it was it was more like a concrete ceiling (laughs) I'm saying glass because I personally don't think that there's ever a time where you're ever going to be really stuck Mm -hmm. in something um there's always a a way to break out of that glass ceiling but um for you Doug because this this is your podcast is your show it's not mine uh when would you say is the right time to change direction, pivot from the ceiling that you've reached? So I'm going to preface this by saying beware of shiny object syndrome. So most of the time people change their product, they change their direction, they change their strategy because they see another one that seems shiny, right? And um, I've, been, I've been victim of this in the investing game, right? So I spent a lot of money and time in investment groups, as well as getting into investments that are all paying off now. Don't get me wrong, but I kind of took my eye off of the business and it hurt the business. And all of a sudden the investments were paying for the business. And so be, beware of shiny object syndrome. Too many, too many, especially in sales orgs, too many of these guys and especially sales reps and new managers, they hear about a new product. You know, they hear about a higher margin. They hear about this new, new, right? Mm -hmm. And they think that they need to be on top of it or else they're going to lose something. That's a scarcity mindset. Right. You know, so my instinct is always going to be stay the course. And so if I do start getting that feeling that, okay, hey, maybe this isn't going to work out for us as a company, because I have taken on security products that haven't worked out. I have taken on um, solar products. Uh, division or products that haven't worked worked out and so the first thing is it's a feeling it's a gut feeling you get that first little twinge in your stomach you know what I mean you hear that voice in the back of your head like hey this isn't looking good you know and so at that point you need two forms of validation okay in order for you to move away from that product that division that strategy whatever the case may be the first form is going to be validation for my team. My team is going to be coming to me 
with issues about that division, that product, that strategy, right? So they're going to be they're going to be voicing their opinions to me. They're going to be communicating to me that hey, there's an issue here, and you need to know about it, right? So you have to have good communication between you and your team, whether it's staff, sales management, sales people. You want to always have that open communication so you can get validation from them that maybe this let's just call it a division. Maybe this division isn't working out. You know what right. I'm saying? So that's the first validation I need to get. And then the second validation I need to get is from the numbers. I need to dive into the numbers and see that whether it's not working out because the margins aren't there, like uh, Jacob was saying, or it's not working out because the volume's not there. Usually the numbers always tell the story. And again, you want to see it through. You want to give it at least 90 days before you make a a big decision like that, a big pivot. Because when I was a younger entrepreneur, I would see a P&L and something wasn't working out and boom, I would change it right away. Instead of, like you said, breaking through that glass ceiling, which I know that terminology isn't right, but still it it makes sense, concrete versus glass, if we're not talking about uh, discrimination, right? Right. So breaking through that glass ceiling uh, you can, you can do that oftentimes when you stay the course and everybody around you is jumping ship and you stay that course, all of a sudden you're the only one in the, in the, the market for that product. Right. And so, um, at that point, all right, it's a gut feeling. I've gotten the validation from my team. I've gotten the validation from the numbers. And now I need to exit plan. Okay. Cause the worst thing you can do is change things on your salespeople, on your staff, on your executive team is change things on them without a plan. You know, you need to have an exit plan in place or we're switching products and this is why, you know what I'm saying? Like you you need to have a full-on sales presentation for your whole company so they can understand why you're making this change and you're still going to have some people pissed off. You know what I'm saying? It could <laughs> make human sense nature. from A to Z, but you are changing something and human nature does not like change, which is why entrepreneurs are so few and far in between. True entrepreneurs are so so few and far in between because you have got to be able to pivot. So that's kind of my answer on that, Jacob. Beware the shiny object st- syndrome. It's a gut feeling. Then you get the validation from your team and the numbers, and then you put together an exit plan. Awesome. And our last question of this particular Q&A comes from Scott Conway. Hey Doug, Scott Conway here, Head of Sales and Operations at LGG Media. We are a pay-per-click, meaning search engine marketing, but also social media marketing and telemarketing, performance-based marketing agency, and it's HIRO certified, and wanted to know what do you love to do, what are you great at doing, and then how is it that you make processes and procedures around that, because oftentimes these things don't necessarily come naturally to us. So this is all about you, Doug. What do you love? What are you good at? And how do you share that vision with the company? So, yeah, I love this question because it's it's going to be about mindset and it's going to be tactical on the back end. So um, what do I love to do? I love starting things, right? So in business, there's starters and finishers. I'm a starter, you know, uh, it took me a while to come to this conclusion, but I'm an idea man, right? And I love getting about halfway through and then handing it off for somebody else to run with. Because <laughs> at that point, I'm bored. Let's be honest. <laughs> That's so straight fair. up. Straight up, I'm a starter. I know it. I, I love it. And that's why, like, I love the podcast because you're starting a new conversation, a new relationship sometimes with every episode, you know? Um. So I love starting things, and I love the the podcast. Um, What am I great at? Uh, I'm great at building great sales teams because I've been doing it for 10-plus years. You know what I'm saying? And so through that, I've developed Kodak, and uh, that is an SOP in itself. That's an auditing system against those sales teams to to make them great, right? Um, So that's what I'm great at. And then uh, the last question is, how do you build processes and procedures around that? So uh, I'm going to go high level and start with, uh, I work in the EOS system, you know, that's the entrepreneur operating system. Uh, It was developed by the author, Gina Wickman, 
And if you haven't read, read Traction. Um, and, uh, you know, you got to understand the visionary, visionary integrator role. So uh, because I like starting things, that puts me in the visionary category. You know, I come up with the idea. I come up with the plan, maybe some of the systems, you know what I'm saying? But um, at the end of the day, the ind- integrator is going to coach those to execution, right? And so I'm a visionary. Uh, Wayne is more of my integrator. He's the coach, right? And then I've got my staff on, under that. And we all work on the EOS model. And we use a software called 90. And so the, uh, Scott was asking about, you know, processes and procedures. So 90 outlines the hierarchy of the company, who's responsible for what, what department. And you see it all visually. So that's the first way that I do it is visually, right? And then the, the second way, and I have my whole team redoing SOPs right now for this is uh, written, right? So a step one through 20 on things like payroll or things like recruiting or um, onboarding, offboarding, visual. And then the last way that we uh, do our SOPs is through Loom. So we're doing a video presentation basically of the SOP being done in real time. So it can be trained on, it can be executed on, plug and play. Somebody gets hit by a bus tomorrow, we can replace them the next day and they can just follow the SOP, right? That's a uh, cold way to think about it, but it's <laughs> the way businesses it <laughs> it's the way businesses run. You know yeah. what I mean? If if you if you aren't prepared for anyone in your team or yourself to get hit by a bus tomorrow, you know, your business isn't ready for all the things that can be thrown at it. You know what I mean? And so that's why systems and processes are, are so important. And uh, I know Scott's a beast when it comes to those things. He's got some amazing things cooking up. So definitely go check him out. But I appreciate the question, Scott. Uh, hopefully that that answered a lot of it there. Yeah, I, I definitely think it did um, because one, uh, it's it's refreshing to see someone um, lean so far into something that they love to do. Mm-hmm. So if if you are if you love building great sales teams, um, and you you take that time to build processes around building great sales teams. Uh, it definitely gives other entrepreneurs and other, you know, listeners to this podcast a way to see, Hey, uh, it's okay to love what you do and do it well. And there's, there's a place for it. Um, most people, myself included, will kind of put a back burner Mm -hmm. to the stuff that they love to do because they feel like I need to, I need to sacrifice my great for good right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think this was a great question because it it definitely brought out that you don't have to sacrifice your great, just be able to share your great with others. You know what I mean? Well, and yeah, you don't have to, right? But if you're just starting out, say you're a brand new entrepreneur and uh, you love being a starter but you can't afford to pay a finisher. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so so that type of stuff happens, you know, or maybe you're a few years into it and you can't afford to pay a finisher, but not without paying them more than you're getting paid. Right. You know what I mean? So it's like there is going to be a sacrifice along the way, one way or the other, you know? And I think the reason I have so much peace of mind, even when the cash flow's negative or... um you know, we're not knocking it out of the park in sales is because I'm willing to sacrifice these huge profits or these huge commissions because I want to work in my zone of genius. You know what I'm saying? And I feel like the longer I work in my zone of genius and the longer I sacrifice income for that, then the bigger what I'm building is. I spent the first uh, 10 years in business going after the income. You know what I'm saying? I proved that I could do that. I did that. That was fun. But it also made me somewhat miserable. You know what I'm saying? You do that for so long. As a new entrepreneur, you start out, you do it for a few years, and then you immediately delegate it Okay. as soon as you can (laughs) afford to because you know what makes you happy. You know what I'm saying? And so um, I'm in that zone right now, especially with our RPD division. You know, I haven't talked about it a whole lot, our referral partner division, but I'm excited about that, developing everything for it right now. And uh, I'm in my zone of genius, you know? And so, um, and then I get to hand it off to Wayne when it's all 
packaged and done and you get to start and he can, then he not can, finish <laughs> he does though he he'll take something yeah. that i've put together and then he'll light a fire under it you know what i mean that's what he did with solar you know yeah and so um it works for us that's the visionary integrator 100 percent. yeah you guys make a great team and uh, i feel like you you need to get wayne on the podcast more i just you know. <laughs> <laughs> no wayne is great did he promise you a bonus or something if you no, said that <laughs> you know what <laughs> He might be sliding me something under the table. I don't yeah, know. I don't no. know. <laughs> no, that no. Wayne is great, and uh, you guys are great. I appreciate you uh, having me on for this episode. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a lot of fun, um, and since I am you, I guess I have to to end it with the uh, what legacy are you trying to know? <laughs> <laughs> oh shit! No, we, we don't have another thirty minutes, do we? Okay. <laughs> no, we don't. But uh, yeah, how how can they reach you? If they want to want to connect with you, possibly for um, consulting, maybe they want to ask questions and be mm-hmm. on the next Q and A uh, for building great sales teams. Where can they find you at? Yeah, so we're going to start coming out with these Q and As every two weeks. I think is is the goal that we're gonna we're gonna do. And so once a week, we're gonna put it out there in uh, the building great sales teams group, as well as uh, sales talks with sales pros. Um, and I think there's a few other groups we're going to put it out in. And then also, obviously, on my personal page. Um, so if you want to submit a question, uh, no matter what it is, we're going to try to categorize them on a biweekly basis. You know, so the, the next one I want to do is around recruiting, uh, a recruiting Q&A. So if you have a question you want to submit, just go to txbizdad.com. And that's going to have all my socials on there. You can submit through Facebook Messenger, Instagram message, TikTok, LinkedIn. I got them all. And uh, you can message through there. And then my assistant will reach out to capture the video from you. And she organizes everything so that we can do this episode just like this. Mm -hmm. And make sure your uh, makeup and your hair is done because mine is not today. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) No, no. Yeah. So Texas Biz Dad, T-X-B-I-Z. DAD.com is going to have all of Doug's socials on there. So if you have questions uh, that you would like answered by uh, Doug on the Building Great Sales Team podcast, um, feel free to reach out to us there uh, so we can get you on the podcast. We can get those questions answered for you um, and also uh, give you a little shout out so we can, uh, you know, add value to your life as you add value to others. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you very much for joining us today. And you guys have a wonderful time. Let's get building. That's my line. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Building Great Sales Teams. Be sure to appreciate it. If you haven't done so already, make sure you're subscribed to the show wherever you consume podcasts. This way you'll get notifications as new episodes become available. Remember, great sales teams are not recruited. They are built block by block. Until next time.